Listen, as, uh, as someone who communicates to large groups of people for a living, uh, the discipline of subtlety is what makes communication fresh and fun. You, you may not realize it, but it is hard work that goes into creating subtle jokes or subtle pop references or subtle pop illustrations that ultimately help carry a message forward. It's incredibly rewarding, quite frankly, uh, to suggest that Chandler Bing or Ben Rector or Elmer Fudd might actually have something to say about the truth of Scripture, that a, that a lyric from a song or a line from the show Friends might have something to say about God's kingdom on earth, that they might actually speak to the truth. It's hard work, friends, whether you know it or not, to have fun with wordplay, uh, like alliteration or assonance with consonants that begin a word. You see what I did there, right? All that work for very little return. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, oftentimes, oftentimes, those who are here in the office or in my home, they have to deal with the regular sort of five-year-old just as something he shouldn't smile or the girlish giggle that always comes when I write those kinds of things. And friends, it's in those moments, actually, when I'm probably sitting a little too proudly on my high horse, uh, that those here in the office and those in my home suggest to me, Pastor, Brian, Dad, sometimes simple is the best. (laughs) Well, friends, it's hard to believe, but we are rapidly approaching the end of our Lenten journey, which culminates in that week of Jesus' passion, Uh, beginning first, of course, on Palm Sunday when Jesus rides into Jerusalem and concluding on Easter Sunday when all of the world rejoices at the resurrection And this journey towards that week, this journey of Lent, is really about a journey of discovery, a discovering really Jesus' purpose on earth to bring whole person healing to the whole world, but also to discover the strategy by which Jesus is going to bring whole person healing to the whole world, namely through death and resurrection, through cross an empty tomb through Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And thus far, friends, thus far, Jesus has, in ways, been very subtle in his approach to revealing both this purpose and this strategy. So if we went all the way back to the beginning of the season of Lent, we started in a desert where Jesus withstands the temptations of the evil one. There, hinting, hinting that perhaps... His work on earth will lead to a change of those who are in power. Or as he stands outside of Jerusalem, weeping over people, the same people that he wants, right? He wants to embrace, to protect, to provide for, to be a caregiver for. He's weeping over people that he loves and ultimately a people that he knows will reject him. But Jesus himself says, I'll continue to press on today and tomorrow and the third day until finally the Father brings me to the goal. In other words, there's nothing, nothing that will keep Jesus from pursuing people and bringing this whole person healing to the whole world. Not even, not even the people's rejection. Or last week, Jesus, like Elmer Fudd, hunting people down hunting the lost so they might be found, seeing beyond the antics and the behaviors and the issues of people like you and me. Jesus has been subtly dropping hints. He's been subtly giving pictures and telling stories to reveal to those who, quote, have eyes to see it, his purpose and his strategy. But this week, friends, Jesus is done being subtle. He takes on a not-so-subtle approach. While he still tells a parable, it is nevertheless a very pointed parable. And if we could skip ahead to the very end of this parable, we would read this. The, The teachers of the law and the chief priests, they looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. 
But of course, they were afraid of the people. And so, keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be sincere. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said, that they might hand him over to the power and the authority of the governor. It was quite clear to them what Jesus was saying. So in an effort to follow Jesus well on this front, I'm not going to spend time trying to be subtle or to drop inside jokes. I'm not going to work overly hard to find the perfect illustration and bring all of this to a different angle of Jesus. Rather, I'm I'm just going to let Jesus speak for himself and to allow the parable to do to us what the parable certainly did to the hearers of Jesus' day. So, Let's get there. Luke chapter 20, uh, verse 9. You'll need a Bible, digital, analog, the one you brought, the one that's there. It doesn't matter. Uh, And we're going to go to Luke chapter 20, Luke chapter 20, starting at verse 9. Luke chapter 20, uh, starting at verse number 9. Luke writes this. He says, he went on to tell the people this parable. Now, let's stop here. Yes, I'm already stopping. Calm down. We'll keep going. He went on. Uh, He went on, suggesting that he had done something before it, that he was continuing to do whatever it was he was doing. So what was he doing? Well, let's back up chapter 20, verse 1. Uh, Jesus is in the temple here, and he is teaching. He's proclaiming good news, and as he does so, the the religious elites— the teachers of the law, the scribes, the Pharisees, the elders of the people, they, they want to know by what authority Jesus is doing all of this teaching. Basically, they want his credentials. Like, like who said it was okay that you could teach these things in the temple today? Who, who do you think you are that you would speak with such authority? Why don't you just tell us who gave you this authority? Now, but before Jesus answers the question, he first poses one of his own. And here's what he says. He says, okay, tell me, John's baptism, was that from heaven or was that of human origin? Now, personally, I, I think this is a brilliant move on Jesus' part. Not that Jesus needs me to tell him that it's brilliant. It is brilliant. But here's the thing. Jesus knows two things. One, they're going to struggle to answer the question. And two, by recalling John the Baptist, he will force them to remember the message of John the Baptist. What was John preaching there in the desert, in the wilderness? Well, he's preaching the words of Isaiah, right? A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight paths for him, John would say, to the crowds. Now, who are the crowds at John the Baptist's day? Scribes, teachers of the law, elders of the people, along with a crowd. The the same people who are asking Jesus for his credentials were the same people listening to John the Baptist. What does John say to them? He says, you brood of vipers. Now, I think you should take that cut, you know, that kind of cut down and just throw it in your pocket when, you know, someone's been mean to you. Like, if you don't get the coffee, the barista, they didn't make it right. Like, you brood of vipers. Just throw that out and see what happens, right? You brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, John says. And then he goes on to say this. You need to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, Uh, John the Baptist's message was very simple. It's this. If you are in the way of the Lord, if you are following God's Torah, then your life ought to look a certain way. It ought to exemplify humility, service, love for all people, especially the broken. John the Baptist's message, this fruitful living, will matter as Jesus begins to tell the parable. So fast forward again. Here we are back at verse 9. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard. He rented it to some farmers, and he went away for a long time. And at harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants, so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. 
So, a man plants a vineyard, and what do we expect the vineyard to produce? I'm actually asking. Grapes, right? And what's better than grapes? Preach. That's right. Amen. Right? Really, really, really good fruit ends up being white. So, wine. So, so the reality is the owner expects the vineyard to do what the vineyard does. So he plants a vineyard, and he expects that there will be fruit that comes from that vineyard. God has produced a people, the people of Israel. He's created a covenant with them where he says, listen, I'm going to be your God, and you're going to be my people. And it is his expectation of the people that he's produced and planted in a promised land that their life would produce fruit, that they would do what it is they're supposed to do, that the life of his people would be one of love, both for him and their neighbor. Now, if we walk backwards into the Old Testament, and if we just remember the people of Israel, right, who have been rescued from Egyptian slavery, they've been brought through the wilderness, they're taking possession of the promised land, and God's call to them as they enter into that land is to be salt and light, to be a people who love so deeply both their God and the people around them that it would be a witness to their Gentile and pagan neighbors, that Israel's lives would look different from everybody else. Now, if you read the Old Testament history books, this would be like Judges, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, uh, it doesn't take a long read to realize that Israel's life was jacked up. Like they, they did not produce the fruit that God expected of them. And what's the result? Well, God doesn't annihilate them, but he sends to them prophets. Prophets who would proclaim the word of God, who would proclaim repentance, a turning away of the things of their flesh, a turning away from the God's of the land, a return these prophets would preach to God himself. And when they did, the prophets proclaimed, if you were to turn back to God, then once again, your lives would reflect the heart of God to the world. But again, in the Old Testament, rather than embrace this kind of hard-hitting truth bomb of the prophets, Israel often chose to seek their own destruction. How did they do that? They got rid of the very prophets who were trying to lead them back to God. Often scorn them, beat them, even kill them. They simply get rid of those who make their life uncomfortable. And friends, it's, it's this very thing that Jesus is trying to capture in the parable, verses 10 through 12. Right, when the owner of the vineyard would repeatedly send servants to seek fruit only for those servants to be beaten and shamefully treated. So what does the owner of the vineyard do? The owner of the vineyard decides to send his son, the heir of the vineyard. Surely the owner thinks they'll listen to him. They wouldn't dare have the audacity to reject him. Surely they have enough wisdom to give the heir that for which he seeks. Verse 14 says this, but when the tenants saw him, they talked this matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. And so they threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. Even the son will be mistreated, scorned by the servants, taken outside the boundaries of the vineyard. And there, outside the boundaries, he would be slaughtered. The son of the father bleeding to death. And those servants, those servants of the vineyard will say to themselves, well done. Well done. Now nobody gets to tell us what to do. You know, having sent the prophets of old, the father who longs 
for his people to love them with their whole heart. The Father finally sends the Son, the heir of heaven. God's people will listen to what Jesus has to say. Surely, surely they will rest in his word. Having having listened to that word, they would exhibit a fruitful life in the kingdom. And yet as we read this text, those who bore the responsibility of the vineyard, those who bore the leadership of Israel, those teachers of the law, the scribes, the Pharisees, the elders of the people, when they encounter God's Son, when they encounter the heir of heaven, when they encounter Jesus, they think to themselves, how can we get rid of him? Look at the end of verse 16. When the people heard this parable. They said, God forbid. And they can't imagine in that moment that God would send a son and the son would be killed and that the owner of the vineyard would rain down justice, killing servants and giving the vineyard to others. I mean, that's preposterous. And then catch this. Jesus looks directly at them and he asks, well, what is the meaning that of which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. It's a quote right from Psalm 118. Psalm 118 declares that the rejected stone, the one who is cast out, would become literally, uh, the word means the head of the corner. Uh, The stone which would bring together two sides and would bear the weight necessary to make those two sides stand together. See, Jesus would be rejected by the very people he's speaking to. He would be killed outside of town. He would bear the weight of the whole world, bringing together the Father and his people. Now, if we were to fast forward to today, we apply these words of Jesus to our own lives, (laughs) Some of you are probably saying, all right, well, this parable is obviously a scathing critique of church leadership. (sighs) Pastor, tough to be you. But here's the deal. After the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, there is a new Israel, which has nothing to do with geopolitical place. The new Israel is the church. The body of believers, it is you and me, those who faithfully profess faith in the Son of God, professing faith in the hero of heaven, the one who for our sake is taken outside the walls, who's slaughtered on a hill, who bleeds to death, the one who's rejected, who's despised, who's scorned, and yet who would bear the weight of all of it for you and me to bring us together with the Father, so that we could be together. And friends, like Israel, you and me, this new Israel, the church, it is God's expectation that our life would bear fruit, that we would be examples of humility and service and love, that our lives would bear the fruit of the kingdom. And friends, we have to resist the urge that when God's Word instructs us or when God's Word admonishes us or God's Word corrects us, when we encounter Jesus and when He wants our lives to look more like His, we have to resist the urge to run to others who say what we long to hear. We have to resist the urge of dismissing Jesus, of simply throwing Him out, but rather we have to come to Him broken. In fact, we have to fall on Him And when we fall in the truth of what Jesus has done for you and me, it breaks us to pieces. It breaks us to pieces. Broken. And in repentance, we come to him. Broken and in need of repair. And then we allow him, through death and resurrection and ascension, to put us back together. You know, it's interesting. It's in the the waters of baptism, in water and, and words, right? 
that God somehow miraculously and mysteriously connects us to that stone that was rejected. Miraculously and mysteriously connecting us to one who will become the cornerstone. And then in some way, as we rise to him, you and I become little stones, living stones. Connected to that cornerstone, you and I built into a temple of his own making, put back together by a resurrected and ascended Christ. A St. Peter says it this way. He says, as you come to him, the living stone, which has been rejected by humans but chosen by God, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, a royal priesthood, offering your lives as sacrifices that are acceptable to God. For in Scripture it says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and a precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him, you and me, will never be put to shame. Friends, there's nothing subtle about Jesus in this parable. There's no grand illustration. There's really not a lot of wordplay here, no assonance or alliteration. Just the simple truth that when we approach Jesus, approach Him in brokenness and repentance, shattered in pieces, He is the one who by His death and resurrection and ascension will bring whole person healing to the whole world, to you and to me. Uh, don't tell the staff. My family can plug their ears, but sometimes simple is best. To God be the glory. Amen. And so may the peace of God, which surpasses all of our human understanding, guard and keep our hearts in Christ today and every day. Amen.